so first of all thank you so much for agreeing doing this sir a very warm welcome to this form and for our audience uh, like today we have with us uh, mehir vora sir chief investment officer at trust mutual fund uh, a remarkable career of uh, which which span across almost three decades in the financial markets he has a proven track record across various asset classes to name a few equity fixed income real estate and ifs so before joining trust mutual fund sir held the position of senior director and chief investment officer at max life insurance where he managed assets exceeding 1 lakh 30000 crores and prior to that he had uh, worked in various senior roles at the great notable financial institutions to name a few aditya birla sun life mutual fund abu dhabi investment authority hspc mutual fund abn amro mutual fund icci prudential sbi mutual fund so a very warm welcome sir will request you to start with like how your journey started and then we move on to the current outlook of the market over to you sir hi good evening uh, thanks for hosting me and uh, uh, welcome to all the listeners here uh, always a pleasure to talk with investors and uh, and friends uh so prince uh, how much time do we have <laughs> and what do, what do you want me to cover on my journey so sir um, we have all the time it's like uh, at your discretion so how much time you give us uh, that would be great we will be grateful for that sir. so great uh, so you know i am a engineer and an mba and uh, come from a, a middle sized town uh, from gujarat Uh, born and brought up there did my engineering also in 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 baroda many years ago uh and uh, after working for an en- as an engineer for a an year uh i decided to pursue mba because uh, obviously once you start working and realize that engineering can only get you so far in terms of career and and progression decided to do an mba and that's how i ended up at i am lucknow and you know sometimes uh, you're not very clear as to how your career is going to go and you just take it as it goes and one decision at a time and and uh, the reason why i'm not in a, a big big three consulting firm probably and uh, and uh, i'm in the financial markets managing money uh, is because on day one of my placement uh, season at i am lucknow i i got an offer from one of the big consulting firms uh, uh to work in bombay uh, uh and it had a certain salary but being not being from bombay obviously i needed a place to stay so sbi mutual fund also gave me an offer on the same day with the same salary but with the additional benefit of housing <laughs> and that's how i ended up uh, working and starting my career as a as an analyst and then as a fund manager in sbi uh, and that was because of bombay real estate so sometimes uh life you know uh, makes your decisions for you and i have never ever regretted uh, that decision and uh, you know i enjoy what i'm doing for the last uh, 29 years and uh, and there is nothing else i would rather do uh, so that's that's how i basically ended up as as a fund manager and a cio in bombay so started my career uh, and luckily it was uh, sbi mutual fund and it was the beginning of the first round of non uti mutual funds in the country uh, so if you remember the first round of uh, non uti mutual funds uh, were set up uh, in in 1987 and 1988 uh, where some of the psu banks like sbi canara bank bank of india indian bank started were allowed to start mutual funds and of course sbi was amongst the early players and uh, by 1994 they had gone to a certain size and and we were rapidly expanding uh then uh, post 95 96 we saw a host of private sector mutual funds being set up and that's how really the explosion in the mutual fund industry started and i'm happy that i was I was part of that whole growth of the private sector mutual fund industry for the last uh, 29 30 years uh so and at that time you know uh, as luck would have it uh, there were not many trained fund managers like we have today so it was all learn as you go on the fly so young mbas you know being made analysts and fund managers and traders in the stock market 
uh, with with guidance from some of the senior members from SBI, who of course uh, had limited experience in the capital markets. They were good bankers and good financial, uh, had a good financial understanding of companies, etc. But not probably so much in the stock market. So we had a limited pool of mentors to kind of uh, learn from. And we were essentially learning from reading and learning off each other and you know, basically learning on the fly, as you would say. And I'm really uh, glad and lucky and, and grateful uh, to, to the initial set of companies uh, who let us young people, you know, really manage money and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, train us, so to say, uh, to become what we are today. So, you know, we were extremely lucky in that sense that we could... We were there in that uh, in this industry at that point in time when the when the you know, inflection point or, or rather the inception point was was happening. Uh, <clears throat> so one thing led to another, and of course, after gaining experience, moved on to various other mutual funds in in larger roles. Uh, essentially, from being an analyst uh, to becoming a fund manager uh, very very quickly in the in the first uh, three four years. And then, of course, I've been a fund manager and head of equities and CIO at, at different places for the last uh, so many uh, 29 years of my career. So essentially, that's how, you know, we have grown up along with the growth of India, along with the growth of the stock markets and along with the growth of the mutual fund industry. And, you know, happy to, uh, you, know, you know, have been part of this, frankly speaking. Great, sir. Very interesting. And I must say, Serendipity has a very big role to play as far as like uh, the, the initial uh, journey when it starts in the financial market. Very well said, sir. So, sir, uh, currently, like the market is divided in the opinion that uh, there is a lot of froth which has built up in the small and mid cap space. And parallel people are also saying that large cap has uh, not performed that well in last two three years so possibly the year 2024 is going to be the year of large cap so do you buy this statement and if i were to ask you like the incremental money which is coming to the market how you see that is driving the market uh so large caps have underperformed mid and small caps i think only this year otherwise uh uh, post uh, covid uh, we did see uh, a huge outperformance uh, huge performance of the large caps uh, and of course mid and small caps uh, have caught up and more than caught up uh, since then especially in the last one year because of the huge uh, uh, rally that we have seen but i don't think large caps have done so badly uh, uh, pre covid and post covid uh, it's just that uh, mid, mid and small caps had to catch up which they have and now even probably overshot in the last uh, couple of months uh, so having said that, you know, a couple of caveats before I make any statements on large caps, small cap, mid caps. One is that the universe of large caps is is limited, hundred stocks, uh, hundred fifty stocks. Uh, similarly, mid caps also are about hundred hundred fifty stocks. So the number of stocks in large and mid category are not that high, frankly. Uh, but the 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 universe of mid, uh, the, the, but the universe of small caps is very large. Uh, so to make a blanket statement on small caps is, is a little difficult. Uh, but yes, at the index level, uh, mid caps do, like, do, look, expen do look expensive. Uh, the small cap 150 or small cap 250 index also does look uh, a bit expensive at the index level. Uh, but there is enough scope for stock picking because there are so many sectors and sub small sectors and themes out there uh, to still pick and choose from. Uh, compared to say one year ago, it's more difficult uh, to choose because a lot of things have gone up and probably don't offer so much value. But that does not mean that there are no opportunities left uh, in, in the space. So, you know, one can't really make a blanket statement that all small caps are expensive. Uh, there is uh, uh, a little bit of hard work required. But yes, there will be opportunities to make money even in the small cap space. But yeah, at the aggregate level, index level, large cap indices do look more reasonable. Uh, couple of things. One is that we are trading at say probably one sigma above historical averages, uh, which is a bit expensive, but not horribly expensive, I would say, for the Nifty. Uh, and we are expecting about 15% earning growth for the next uh, one to two years. Uh, so with the 15% earnings growth with a valuation, which is one sigma above average, there is some some more scope for the Nifty to, uh, to perform and give absolute return. So uh, if I were to, you know, take a bet on the index, I would maybe prefer the large cap indices versus the mid and small cap indices. 
fair point sir and sir so many new amcs uh, these days so how you see the space uh, panning out from here so do you see uh, the, we have enough uh, space so as to accommodate all the players or it would be uh, a consolidation down the line a few years maybe from here i think uh, we are still you know hugely underpenetrated as a as a industry in terms of percentage of savings in mutual funds compared to the overall financial savings and overall household savings we are still very 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 far away from being saturated so i don't think the fact that we have 30 or 40 amc is the matters really there is ample scope for growth for everyone that's one uh, second is uh, while the industry itself will grow uh, it's about 40 lakh crores uh, uh, currently obviously uh, uh, that 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 will double in size in the next uh, of four five years so th- as it is there is enough scope for incremental growth uh, and second is i think uh, there is enough scope for some differentiated performance and strategies and philosophies because uh, some of the I, w- i would say the larger you grow the some of the large amcs probably uh, tend to uh, you know become too large and uh, to that extent uh, the quantum of outperformance or performance that is uh, Uh, that is there may not may not be you know achievable by some of them maybe they have become too risk averse etc so i think there is ample scope and we have seen in uh, a few of the AM, newer amcs where there has been good performance and uh, you know some differentiated strategies uh, assets have come so i think there is enough scope for a differentiated approach uh, and superior performance uh, uh, to grow right sir and seeing the quantum of sips uh, which has increased over a period of time so currently uh, there were uh, like uh, when i was interviewing other financial practitioners practitioners so they were saying like even the mutual fund managers or they are facing problem i mean they have some compulsory um, what we say um, they have to invest in companies and that is somewhat creating overvaluation in those uh, especially the small cap front so do you i mean uh, buy this statement or this is i mean too vague a statement to make uh, uh, difficult to say you know because again uh, it depends if if a large amc is getting large inflows in a small cap fund which they keep buying uh, every month or whatever then it may create a problem Uh, uh but but i'm sure that you know fund managers and analysts also are keeping track of valuation so i wouldn't say it's a it's a widespread issue i would say all right sir and sir on the incremental money say if somebody has to invest uh, today or maybe you as a fund has to invest the incremental money where would you be positioning yourself be it the sectoral thing or maybe if uh, on the basis of mark market caps or whichever way you want to explain uh see if it it, it all depends on the fund uh, first of all uh, fund and fund objective uh and second is i really don't uh you know uh, I, i i say i i don't really look at stocks uh, necessarily uh, as a, a top down call alone uh there is always a combination of top down and bottom up i would say uh, for example when you are selecting a stock you will always have a view on the economy or the segment or sector that the stock is operating or the company is operating in so there is always a small element of uh, top down uh, view that you have to take when you are taking a view on a company the bottom up is is of course the nitty gritty of analyzing the company the fundamental the management etc so that of course is the bottom up part but there is always the element of top down in terms of macro or sector calls that that needs to be taken so uh, i don't really uh, you know necessarily take only a top down call where in say i'm i'll put uh, x money into a certain sector yes i would like to put uh, be overweight on certain themes uh, certain sectors but uh, that has to be justified by the bottom up uh, uh, fundamental and and valuations and so the, the the amount of money which fis are uh, and infusing in the market that is a, uh, another element uh, which you can say that large caps ought to perform well because uh, uh, obviously when uh, big money come and um, there would be the natural choice of investment uh so let me kind of uh, 
elaborate a little bit uh, on what my uh, observation is. Uh, first of all, the ratio of FII money uh, to domestic money has changed dramatically over the last uh, few years. So earlier, FII inflows and outflows used to be a much larger, much larger proportion compared to the <clears throat> domestic money. So, uh, say uh, a 10,000 crore buying or selling by FIIs in a given week or month uh, would have a large impact on the markets. Uh, but now, because of, uh, you know, an exponential rise in the uh, domestic money flowing into the markets through uh, direct DMAT accounts, broking accounts uh, and mutual funds and insurance uh, flows and EPF and NPS flows, uh, the proportion of domestic money and FII money on a flow basis, not necessarily stock basis, stock-wise, on a stock basis, FII holdings are still larger, much larger than the domestic holdings. But on a flow basis, which is what basically drives daily prices, on a flow basis, I think the size of FII and DII have become comparable. Uh, so, the impact of FII flows is to that extent much lesser than what it used to be a few 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 years ago. Uh, so, having said that, FII money, if you again it needs to be broken up into active and passive. Uh, out of the FII flow, whether it's an inflow or outflow, my guess is 60 to 70 percent is uh, is passive allocation, which means that they would be following the global benchmarks, uh, uh, which essentially means that they would focus on the large caps. So, I would say out of the FII money, 60 to 70 percent uh, would flow into large caps. And the balance would be more of a diversified por portfolio. So after uh, after balance, say thirty percent or forty percent, that would be more of a diversified portfolio with uh, fund managers taking active bets uh, in large caps as well as mid and small caps. So that's that's the breakup of the FI flows. I would say uh, the domestic flows again uh, is more of a I would say a diversified flow, flexi cap flow, uh, and to that extent, what we are seeing incrementally is less inflows into large caps, but more inflows into flexi cap and mid and small cap funds. So to that extent, my guess is about uh, five to 6,000 crores of uh, money would be flowing into small and mid cap funds uh, uh, or, or just small cap space uh, every month. And, you know, uh, and balance would be in the mid and, mid and large cap space. Right, sir. And and few days ago, sir, you shared uh, the market cap to GD, uh, GDP chart. So, would you like to talk around that? And uh, that would be helpful for our audience so as to understand uh, the broader market. Sure. So, that's, uh, that's the famous uh, Warren Buffet indicator that uh, uh, Warren Buffet uses to judge whether the markets are fairly valued, undervalued or overvalued. And... Uh, well, well, intuitively, it 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 uh, you know uh, it is is very difficult to correlate market cap to to GDP, but that's just one indicator that Warren Buffett uses, and uh, by that indicator we are we are we are tending to be a bit on the expensive side. So you know uh, we know that uh, as as we discussed, there are pockets like mid and small caps in the market which have turned expensive, uh, but uh, but I would say that uh, on a M cap to GDP, probably we are about uh, uh, you know, five percent or ten percent away from the peak, uh, peak kind of uh, uh, valuation uh, uh, to that extent. So, uh, yes, we are a bit on the expensive side, but that doesn't mean that markets can't overshoot. P typically, as I said, we are probably 0.75 to one sigma standard deviations on a PE basis, uh, positive, which means we are a little expensive. But markets never peak out uh, at one standard deviation. We have always seen that markets tend to. Uh, peak out at around 1.5 to 2 sigma. So there is some some more space before we can say that we are really, really overvalued. Right, sir. And lately, uh, one of the interviews, uh, you were talking about that global headwinds were now uh, improving. But again, recently, sir, we saw the Red Sea uh, thing, and that is basically increasing the freight rate and the time for the shipping of uh, various, uh, uh, I mean, export uh, goods. So, do you think uh, that will have uh, a material uh, uh, impact on the market, or uh, that will uh, solve in a, uh, I mean, anywhere in near future? How how you see that? Uh, that that is an emerging risk along with uh, 
the new covid variant that uh, we just you know kind of began to monitor so these are the two risks you're right these are the two risks that uh, i am monitoring very closely uh, the red sea issue can increase freight costs uh, for transportation because then now ships have to take the longer longer route uh, across the cape of good hope in africa and i read that by some estimates uh, the freight cost can go up by about 40% uh, due to due to that route so that's a bit of a inflationary uh, you know factor so to say uh, but uh, you know it's too early to uh, to kind of take a call on that but that is a risk factor that i'm monitoring and the other one is of course as i said the new covid variant where singapore has uh, introduced masking and we've seen some cases in kerala so those are the two emerging risks i'm talking about uh, on the on the on the positive side uh, as we as we speak you know till till uh, if you just ignore these two factors the, that we discussed uh, on the positive side india is ending 2023 and entering uh, 2024 really in a goldilocks uh, situation uh, because a few months till of till a few weeks ago the the scenario that one was uh, the markets were painting was us slips into a recession and of course interest rates go down after, because of that uh, and and kind of uh, then then and then turns around uh, so recession is obviously not not a good thing uh, but what has happened is that growth has been stronger than expected in the us india of course continues to do do well in terms of growth but the us growth numbers have come out better than expected and inflation num- expectations have also started coming off uh, so a hard landing situation is now turning into a soft landing situation where you might see a slowdown but not a recession a slowdown and not a recession along with falling interest rates is really good for risk assets and you know flows to emerging markets uh, uh, you know are are encouraged uh, or you know uh, or accelerated when such a situation uh, happens what has also happened is that while growth rates for countries like china europe japan uh, have been cut so most most country countries growth estimates have been cut in the last uh, few months except us us has been stronger than expected as we discussed but for the rest of the world growth estimates have been cut while indian growth estimates have not been cut so the positioning for india versus the rest of the world has never been stronger as far as growth is concerned even more importantly the positioning of india versus the rest of the world in terms of the china factor india versus china india versus other emerging markets india on a standalone basis and the geopolitical strength that we have shown plus the marketing that we have done for ourselves in terms of the g20 and the the pli scheme reforms and you know uh, softer things like upi being adopted by singapore and upi uh, being you know Uh, given as an example of how social services can be can be delivered using aadhar jandan etc so that softer image of india has also dramatically improved in the last 2 3 years so i think the growth better than the rest of the world india's image has never been better in terms of the strength as a economy and resilience as an economy so i think all these factors are really favorable and to that extent i think flows to india Uh, should continue and accelerate, uh, you know, in the in the situation, uh, except these two risk factors that we mentioned. And sir, I would uh, request your view on two pointers. One is uh, domestic rural demand, and uh, secondly, if you have some data around like export slowdown, or uh, we are doing good on that front. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, rural slowdown is one uh, one uh, week. Uh, ru- not slowdown. Uh, rural demand and not only rural demand but i think demand at the lower end of the income pyramid uh, is 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 still not picking up uh, probably not reached pre covid levels too so to that extent the recovery that we have seen in the in the last one two years uh, is still continuing to be a k shaped recovery by k shaped the recovery we means that the the upper end of the consumption chain uh, uh, continues to do well so we are seeing uh, good demand in say bigger cars uh, suvs versus cars uh, in bikes we are seeing good demand in the premium bikes versus the lower end bikes in housing we are seeing very strong demand in the luxury housing st- uh, segment so across the board i think the the higher uh, income and higher uh, price point categories are doing better uh, and the lower smaller ticket consumption items are still uh, you know growing at a rate which is lower than the 
uh, rest of the economy. So that continues to be a concern. Uh, but my my call is that the way government is anyway continuing to spend on cap on uh, infrastructure development, construction, etc., means that the the lower income category will also recover, and it's taking a little longer. But it doesn't mean that it's not going to recover. Uh, the tax collections are quite robust, and and the government has because of that adequate uh, room to stimulate the economy even now. So so far the government has been quite prudent, and most of the stimulus has been on the capital expenditure side. So the capital expenditure budgets have really been increased, and they are spending a lot on roads and railway and uh, and the works uh, uh, on the government side. So that continues, and and that construction activity is also creating jobs. So I think. The rural recovery and the lower income recovery is happening, but at a slower pace. Uh, but it will happen. And as I said, if, because tax collections are robust, I I see that there's a good chance that you might see before the election next year some more support uh, in terms of subsidies or whatever direct benefits uh, to this segment as a stimulus, uh, just to keep the you know feel good factor uh, uh, when the elections arrive. So I think that's that's something that. Um, is uh, a co- not a cause for worry, I would say, but that is something that I would definitely want uh, want it to improve. But that because then we'll have a robust overall recovery. So that's that's one uh, data point that I w- am monitoring closely as far as the lower income and lower ticket consumption items are concerned. There was a bit of a ray of ray of hope, uh, like in October we did see some pickup in two wheeler sales for the first time. So hopefully that is a that is a leading indicator, but uh, I d- we can't take a definitive call. We'll have to keep monitoring this space. Uh, on the export side, <clears throat> I think uh, exports in general uh, have slowed down in the last month. Yes, and that that is in line with the uh, general trend seen in the U.S. also. So even Chinese exports have been slowing down, which means that. For physical goods, there is a slowdown in the global economy, as, as we discussed. So, uh, the global economy is slowing down, uh, which will impact our exports uh, for sure. Uh, but on the flip side, it also works. Uh, 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 you know, uh, there's a counterbalance because if there's a global slowdown, then oil prices go down, and oil, as we know, is our largest import item. So, there is a bit of a buffer, also counter buffer to export slowdown that we have seen typically. Oil prices may go down, and that will take the uh, you know uh, hit away as far as uh, net exports or net imports are concerned. So that's that's where we stand. All right, sir. And sir, in the last two three years, we have seen the PSU rallies, be it the public sector banks or the PSUs, and uh, obviously the people uh, still carry the perception that uh, the business to government B two G space is. Uh, more of a regulation governed space so do you see any structural changes or you uh, i mean this uh, space is still vulnerable as we saw lately uh, as far as the sugar sector was concerned right so one one a letter and the whole sector was beaten down so likewise do you see some structural changes are happening or uh, i mean it's a temporary good phase for the company uh so I really don't see the PSU space as one homogeneous, uh, you know, sector. Uh, I would still, and I still see it as individual companies and individual sectors. So, for example, yes, while say in the last one year, PSU banks have outperformed, uh, but uh, oil marketing companies have not done that well uh, because they have a different regulatory and uh, political issue to deal with, right? Uh, so, not. All PSUs should be treated the same way. For example, there are companies in the energy space, as we discussed. They 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 have they have the risk of uh, policy flip flops from time to time, depending on uh, inflation concerns, political concerns, etc. Uh, on the other hand, there are defense PSUs which were not in the limelight at all for forever. You know, for 20 years they were not in the limelight, but in the last three four years, uh, as markets have realized that the Government is uh, dead serious about uh, more indigenous production and dead serious about even exports from India as far as defense items are concerned. This space has, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, ha- has uh, really picked up and uh, the stocks are on fire for the last uh, couple of years. So, uh, but we don't know how much upside more is left because uh, when a, when a space emerges, there is al- also a risk of underestimating the potential because. If we are talking about exports from India for defense items, then the 
export market is f- many times bigger than the india's dom- domestic market also uh, th- so the you know, sky is the limit in that case so uh, so that defense segment for example needs, needs to be treated in a different way there are there are companies uh, uh, you know which which are directly indirectly linked to say railway capex as far as government is concerned so those are working differently power sector again you know uh, for a long time the psu uh sect companies in the power space whether it was the power financing companies or power sector financing companies or uh, other companies linked to power or even the capital good manufacturing companies in the psu space getting to the power sector they were in the doldrums for many years but uh, now we realize that <coughs> renewables also need to be supplemented with uh, you know conventional energy and uh, and that's again a a shift that we have seen in the last one year and the relation that uh, renewables uh, can cannot maybe support the peak loads uh, uh, and they need to be you know balanced out with uh, conventional sources also uh, where india has under invested in the last few years so suddenly you see that there is a spurt of investments even in conventional energy sources uh, where there is a bunch of psus which are benefiting so you know each psus stock has a different story and i would still go story by story stock by stock rather than saying that the entire psu space looks good or bad rightly said sir and even the intent of the government appears to be uh, in sync because today we saw the uh, one time uh, relaxation on the ofs for lic so likewise uh, the government is favoring the companies right so sir you were discussing that you would uh, like to be overweight on certain sectors so if you are comfortable talking so which two three sectors you will be like more uh, looking for opportunities from a view of two three years from here so uh you know one one theme that uh, uh, two themes rather broadly uh, is th- one is that indian domestic economy does better than the rest of the world so clearly my preference would be to sectors which are more domestic looking rather than export led like it or you know uh, some of the other exporting companies so essentially it metals energy these are sectors which are more linked to global growth global factors so these are <clears throat> less preferred and the domestic sectors like consumption link sectors or uh, both discretionary and fmcg uh, then we are talking about uh, say uh, uh, banks with support uh, overall gdp growth so b- banking and financials uh, so those are the segments the domestic segments are are the ones which we are looking at including infrastructure and investment link sector so domestic versus global uh, is one thing that we are looking at prefer domestic and within domestic <clears throat> i think there are two broad things which is consumption and and investments so my call is that on, uh, so far in the last 5 10 years it was consumption which was supporting the economy uh, which is of course needed uh, and which will continue to support but only consumption can only in my view give you about 5% gdp growth or 5 5 and 1/2% if you want to grow at 7% or more 7 8 it cannot be without creation of physical infrastructure and physical manufacturing capacity and physical assets so we need to continue and accelerate growth of infrastructure we need private sector capital investment in manufacturing to accelerate dramatically and we also need the real estate sector uh, to do well so all physical asset creation link sectors are the sectors i would uh, be uh, you know overweight on whether it's infrastructure capital goods utilities uh, real estate you know uh, or, or even manufacturing capacities like we are seeing in the electronic space chemical space anything to do with manufacturing i think the government is hell bent on promoting uh not only for gdp growth but also to create jobs india is going to add about 1 crore people every year for the next many years every year in the working age population and these people need need to be given jobs and software cannot and or services alone cannot create the job which in these quantities it has to be linked to construction and manufacturing and that's what i think uh, is going to be the thrust area for the next many years uh, so these segments i'm i'm really you know bullish on right sir uh, and in line of the points you just shared we saw volatility in the market yesterday 
and there was a rebound today so behavior in the market is very important so sir what would be your suggestion to our audience who like uh, are pretty new to the market in the sense they haven't seen uh, all the bulls and bear cycles so how they should uh, like uh, place themselves in such volatility period and uh, are these periods of opportunity or they need to be cautious about so i would say uh, two or three important points one is that uh, you have to be bullish on stocks and stay invested in stocks to make money uh, you know only if you are only if you believe in the long term uh, stock investment theme of wealth creation and the long term growth prospects of india then you should dabble in stocks because if you are not really confident about the underlying thesis of wealth creation possibilities by long term investing in india uh, every correction will see you getting knocked out of the market so first of all only be there for the long term only be there if you believe in the stock market and india story so that's one <laughs> second is don't put everything in one shot i would i would prefer always prefer a staggered investment whether it's in the form of sips or stps or whatever don't put everything in one, one shot that's that's the other advice uh third is that don't leverage because however good your call is however good your you know uh, uh, stock picking is if you are leveraged then volatility will ensure that you get stopped out of the market stop losses will get hit margin calls will happen so if you are leveraged then it becomes very risky to hold on to your uh, long term beliefs even if you are 100% convinced so don't use uh, leverage and fourth is of course uh, do your quality filters don't dabble in junk don't dabble in speculation for the sake of uh, short term gains uh, that's the only way to kind of make sure that it, you don't have a permanent loss of capital i just keep telling all the uh, you know my young analysts who who join me that and, and then ask for advice like you are uh, that how do you how do you make money how do you make a career successful career in the market or make money in the market i said this market is so full of opportunities that you know anybody who stays long enough will get wealthy in the market so in this market to thrive you just have to survive long enough if you survive in the market long enough you will get wealthy that's that's the that's the core advice great sir and mehr sir like i have seen people they are like directly jumping on to direct investing rather than going via mutual fund although the trend has been change and the people if they don't know much about anything but they would be knowing about the sip and it's a good instrument they know sip is a good instrument Yeah, particularly they don't talk about mutual fund so how how to like condition our expectation to a reasonable level so that uh, once we start with mutual funds and give enough time so as to like build wealth over a period of time and gradually obviously we learn the nuances of direct equity and move on to that so how you would suggest our audience on that front sir see everybody is different and everybody's uh, situation or uh starting points are different so i wouldn't say that you ha- you should only start with the mutual fund but yes you should start with the mutual fund to the extent that mutual funds offers offers your diversified port- portfolio typically uh, the mistake that uh, you know one makes probably is that uh, uh, apart from the four or five points that we just discussed one point i missed out which is good that you brought it up is diversification uh don't put all your eggs in one basket uh, go for a diversified portfolio so whether you buy a mutual fund or you diversify yourself directly uh, diversify do diversify don't put like 50% of your corpus in one stock or whatever something like that so mutual fund do offer you that uh, diversification benefit and of course people like us who are managing money for the long term will ensure that the portfolio has the basic quality filters in place which which as an individual you may or may not be aware of uh, so to say so that's those are some of the advantages of of a mutual fund but on the other side you know unlike say 20 30 years ago for a investor individual investor who wants to start directly there is lots more information available compared to what it was earlier so you know company financials balance sheets transcripts conference calls all those are so readily available which was a struggle 10 20 years ago when we started our careers we hardly had any information you know uh, so uh, for a person who has the time and the bandwidth uh, and the inclination to do directly there is in- enough material available out there Uh, but if it's not your full-time job, 
uh, then obviously it becomes difficult you can't spend as much time as a person like me who who does nothing but uh, this for a living so in, that's a call that the person has to take fair point sir so mayor sir like uh, if you would like to talk about the broader investment framework at uh, trust mutual fund i mean obviously you covered most of it but uh, if something you add, want to add more on that uh sure so you know uh, trust group uh, has you know i would say investments in its dna uh, with people like uh, me of course with long experience and the and the promoter group itself has investments in its dna both for equities and fixed income so i think that's one big advantage that we uh, uh, that we come with that we have you know investing in our blood uh, <clears throat> and we do, we believe as i mentioned in the beginning that there is there is a ample scope for value creation in this market by offering differentiated products and differentiated insights so i think uh, the edge that we have uh, at at trust which we will uh, you know uh, of course use is that information is not an issue as i just mentioned you know there's so much information available about stocks and sectors etc so that's i think equal for all fund managers all kind of mutual funds so that's not an issue at all everybody has the same information what sets us apart is our <clears throat> experience and wisdom to take calls based on that information which is what we call differentiated insights so for the same information for the same inputs that we have for for each sector and stock i believe we have a unique insight as to what the short term and long term drivers of that sector and stock are which which are not apparent uh, uh, to a lot of uh, other investors so i think because of our wisdom and experience uh, and our way of looking at uh, stocks and sectors uh, it is that insight uh, which will set us apart and help us pick stocks earlier and give us the confidence to take larger bets on uh, you know more concentrated and more uh, you know confident bets on those sectors where we believe we have significantly differentiated insight compared to the rest of the market and that i believe is a, is going to be our good source of uh, alpha creation because uh, you know we are we are looking at significant alpha versus the market and that cannot happen with uh, benchmark hugging tactics which it will come from taking conviction long term bets in, in stocks where we have differentiated insights uh, having said that it's not like we have differentiated insights into every stock in every sector it is not easy to come by because it comes with a lot of brainstorming and thinking and introspection and of course the wisdom accumulated over the years so there will be a significant portion of the portfolio about 40 50% of the portfolio which will have stocks which are really you know high conviction with insights which we believe are significantly different from the rest of the market which basically will <clears throat> ensure that we ride the entire up, uptick uh, uh, so up uptrend in the stock not only for say one year or two years but over the longer period of time so these are stocks where we have good concentrated long term bets and ride the entire multi bagger you know philosophy over over over, over a few years uh, essentially what happens uh, you know for the lack of time i would just sum it up in 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 a in a couple of lines one is that <clears throat> in growth stocks and growth markets of, like india a lot of the intrinsic value of a stock or the fundamental value of a stock or company comes not from the near term earnings it comes from the entire earning stream over a long period of time what analysts and fund managers typically do is that we have visibility only for the next 2 3 years as far as earnings are concerned so we tend to extrapolate the current earnings trajectory and then assume that over a five after 5 10 years or 15 years that earnings trajectory will moderate to a certain level what happens is that con- high growth companies and well managed companies continue to grow at a rate which is much better than expected at any point in time so the so what happens is that a lot of the value in a company is because of back ended cash flows not necessarily only because of the near term cash flows and that's where i think the the terminal value of a company which is the cash flows of the far end of the of the of the uh, far end cash flows or or the later cash flows uh, is underestimated significantly underestimated by the market if you have that insight to see the potential of longer term cash flows and longer term sustainability of the business model 
it gives you a huge edge in identifying the value of the stock you know even now as we speak there are stocks trading at 50 60 70 uh, pe of course some of them are expensive and those valuations may not be justified but there are a lot of good stocks at trading at say 50 pe also where even now the market is probably underestimating the growth potential so that can only that confidence and uh, you know uh, uh, stock picking can only come with differentiated insights of terminal value of the stock which we believe uh, which we bring to the table right so great mr sir if you allow last two question one on the sell strategy and one would be from vipin gupta sir if you allow sure okay so like how it goes uh, when you sell a position so as simple as that uh so uh, selling is is uh, either driven uh, so first of all whenever you buy a stock you have a you have a thesis and you have a underlying intrinsic uh, value attributed to the stock we hold on to the stock as long as the thesis is intact and earnings are growing at the rate expected or better than expected obviously uh and as i said we have a certain idea of what the terminal value of the stock can be and that's on a rolling basis examined uh, every 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 now every frequently uh, we would sell a stock under one or two conditions one is either the original thesis is disproven or something has gone wrong or some development which which kind of negates or 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 uh, prevents us from following the original idea or thesis then the story has changed and then we would take a call uh, that probably we now need to sell the stock because the original thesis is no longer valid so that's one event in which we would sell the stock uh, second is if we believe that the valuations are now way beyond any optimistic or long term projection so at, at at absurd valuations then we would stock, sell the stock uh, if we have a good idea of the direction of the terminal value we will not sell a stock just because it is within quotes a little expensive we don't mind paying a little premium uh, as long as we believe that the terminal value thesis that we started off with is still intact great sir so mr vipin uh, you have any question to sir yes sir uh, good uh, good evening mr sir uh, my one question to you is uh, that uh, the way the money is flowing into the market in mutual fund through mutual fund like 15000 16000 crore do we have ample opportunities left uh, investable opportunity left uh, or uh, or you are in a juncture that what to do with that money so uh, your take on that that sir so uh, as i said you know uh, in the large cap space i think there is still ample opportunity uh, so to the extent uh, the bulk of the capital can still be employed without being very worried so to say uh in the other space say mid and mid and small cap space i would say it is more difficult than what it was uh, one year ago i would say okay but uh, the money is ke- kept on flowing so uh, what is your uh, uh, what is your uh, strategy in that uh, scenario because not every fund is a large cap fund so uh, uh so i mean uh, so in a <clears throat> so if it's a flexi cap fund of course the fund manager can put all the money in large caps also if he wants mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right or mm-hmm. or incremental money can be deployed only where you want to want it to be so that's not an issue mm-hmm. uh, the issue would be if it's a 100% uh, mid cap or a 100% small cap fund mm-hmm. there i think then the investor has to make the choice whether he wants to be there okay and uh, uh, down the line uh, next 3 to 4 5 years do you think that uh, market is uh, your uh, uh your industry is going to consolidate uh, like uh, telecom does in last 20 25 years there are so many players in the market so uh, the uh, strong hands remains and uh, the weak hand uh, uh, weak hand will uh, sell off uh, uh, and or take over by the uh, big players in the market do you feel that uh, that is possible in mutual fund industry as well Uh, i think consolidation will happen if only if the promoters uh, want it to happen uh, because unlike uh, you gave the example of telecom unlike telecom we don't need too much capital you know this is not at all a capital intensive industry and this is not a industry in which the amc is leveraged or anything like that you know mm-hmm. 
So as long right. as the uh, as long as your uh, costs are under control, which is basically manpower cost, mm-hmm. uh, and you can you know run the AMC with very lean team. So unless uh, you, your promoter wants to get out, uh, there is no. I, I would I wouldn't say there will ever be distress in the sector, because none of the AMCs are leveraged. You know. Okay. Mm. And, and as I mentioned, अभी तो uh, you know uh, the penetration of uh, financial savings plus the within that penetration of mutual funds and within that penetration of equity mutual funds, which is the profitable part, is still so low. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, Mayor sir, thank you so much. It was really uh, insightful on your end, uh, sharing your thoughts, and you also share your thoughts on your Twitter. So, we really appreciate that, and surely look forward to future interaction as and when you have time. And it was really helpful, so as to understand, and especially in times of great volatility. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, and thanks for hosting me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank, thank you, you sir. sir. Thank you very much. And, and, and for uh, same same to you, sir. And for our audience to who join late, uh, we have recorded the session, and I'll be uploading it uh, soon on the YouTube channel, and I'll post you over Twitter. So those who missed the conversation can surely revisit uh, the. Call. Thank you so much. Good night. Take care.